Scott is going to speak on data science and cyber infrastructures for scientific clean rooms. Dr. Nirchat. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, discuss uh, some of the um, interesting projects uh, that I think will be of interest to the uh, data scientists also. Um, uh, so um, uh, this is a joint work with uh, many uh, different colleagues. I will um, acknowledge my students, my colleagues then at the end of the talk and it's funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, that uh, supported us very generously in this space. So I would like to first set the stage of the scientific cyber infrastructure space that I'm going to be talking about. And then we will be talking about the cloud uh, infrastructure and, and structure uh, that will support these kind of uh, uh, scientific uh, data uh, processing and computation. Um, and I will also point out then uh, some issues in terms of uh, aging of uh, many of the scientific instruments and how one needs to sort of consider the cyber infrastructure and data uh, for these particular scenarios. Um, and the last but not least, I do want to go um, over IoT uh, sensors that uh, are becoming part of the cyber infrastructure around scientific instruments. And we will again talk about some of the data and uh, the cycle of the data uh, to be useful to these scientific environments and clean rooms. So um, uh, I do want to set up the mind uh, that uh, we are having in many, many different disciplines, um, scientific instruments, uh, microscopes, uh, and many of the particular microscopes are multi-million dollar investments for many universities and um, material scientists, semiconductor fabrication researchers are actually um, using these particular instruments in order to develop the next generation materials, generate new chips uh, that we are then using in the computer. Um, and um, these many of these particular equipment uh, uh, instruments are actually in clean rooms, which uh, are then very protected uh, so that the instruments have the correctness. Um, so um, I am mostly uh, working with data uh, that are coming from these kind of digital microscopes, uh, large images, but also other type of metadata that are surrounding these particular images um, in terms of uh, the pressure that the, the material scientists actually put on the material you can imagine in the microscope there is a petri dish and then they put all kinds of chemicals and then put all kinds of stresses on the material to actually do analyze and everything that they do they are keeping track via digital um, data acquisition the prior um, approach actually how they have been collecting the data from this kind of instruments was that they had a local computer that you see there, and then there was a memory stick, and they would actually then upload the data onto the memory stick and then walk the sort of sneaker net to their laptop and upload the data and then process it locally. Well, we currently actually cannot sustain that kind of uh, process uh, for many, many different reasons. One of them is security, right? Memory sticks are just uh, security prone. And um, so um, cloud computing, networking, these particular instrument is becoming very, very important and connect them to really advanced cyber infrastructure where the data can be acquired and processed, analyzed and provide actually visualization to the scientists that uh, then they can see a proper uh, insight. So the data that the scientists actually generate are of very, very different uh, types. Um, you will have very different images. Uh, um, all of these microscopes actually, or other scientific devices will have cameras and taking images, uh, but they also will have 2D different types of points and graphs uh, that uh, will provide uh, uh, to the scientists. The challenges actually of, of these particular scientific instruments that you see for generation of new materials or new chips is that there is a tremendous need for heterogeneous scientific data management and processing. As you saw, a lot of very different images and then metadata sensory information that are inside of the microscopes are coming out. Um, you also have very complex uh, uh, scientific workflows. Workflows in this particular case, think about uh, you get an image, 
And uh, then uh, when, for example, they, the semiconductor fabrication people are doing uh, chips, there are multiple layers where the electrons needs to move and then the particular protection layer of that particular chip so that they are withholding sort of certain uh, are, are robust against temperature, humidity, and so on. And so what actually happens on those images when they basically get processed, the scientists are looking where are currently some of the lines, what is the thickness of these lines, uh, and then end. So um, the processing pipeline workflow on these particular images will be that they get the particular image, then they do some semantic analysis, um, object detection, then they might do actually compression or decompression, depending on if they are compressing. So a lot of sort of, and then they are going to be looking for very, very different types of um, information in those pixels, and that sort of con uh, then represents the data flow, uh, data analysis workflow, and can be very, very complex. Now, um, import, very important aspect that we actually want to do is to shorten the time from the digital capture of the images of the data from these scientific instruments like microscopes up to actually the analysis and then interpretation and insight. According to the National Academy uh, of Sciences, there was actually an analysis that the time between, for example, the data that a material scientist takes and does some analysis to the particular information that it gets to the, to the semiconductor um, fabrication uh, chip designer who uses those particular material, that kind of time takes 20 years. So just to have it think that basically a lot of the data that the material scientists, some of the data just don't get, they usually then get maybe through publications and so on, because many of these research domains, scientific, don't share very well data and their insights. So we currently really have a goal that if we can with the cyber, with the data science to actually uh, create cyber infrastructures where these different domains can actually share the data very quickly, we might really start to see revolutions in new materials, new chips, new computing capabilities. So we definitely need real-time capture and acquisition and not with memory sticks. As I mentioned, uh, some of the older generations basically, or some of the uh, labs might still have in academia memory sticks and memory sticks are bad. They can carry malware and so on. So we really need to connect them to high-speed networks, many of these instruments, and then to modern private clouds so that basically uh, they can immediately be analyzed, immediately be remotely accessed and you can and go through the whole data science cycle uh, to provide much, much faster um, scientific knowledge. Um, and we need the analytics to support gains sort of the insight from the data. So I do want to talk about a little bit some of our sort of thinking in terms of uh, the uh, cloud computing that uh, we uh, proposed and actually also implemented uh, uh, and are working now actually with various uh, different uh, cloud providers to start to sort of see that we can bring this kind of knowledge uh, to them and the scientific labs can actually connect uh, to this kind of environment. So we definitely, with respect to the cloud, went uh, with microservices and I want to actually argue why. So one of the really interesting aspects is, I mentioned you get many of these raw data sets uh, from these microscopes and scientific instruments. There is a whole data analysis workflow to actually get the insight. Um, and um, uh, this particular data and data analytics can be very heterogeneous. And that is very, very different from some of the prior work and prior systems uh, that uh, have worked on monolithic. So for example, we currently at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign have NCSA that gets telescope data from Peru. That's a very monolithic uh, set of data sets. Uh, and they have a whole pipeline, constantly the same, very monolithic workflow uh, that has to happen 
happen in order to find information within the telescope imaging. We currently deal with uh, uh, SEM, TEM, with um, different psychographs and many, many different types of devices. Uh, so the data is always very heterogeneous and you cannot have very monolithic uh, workflows. So this um, microservice environment actually really lends itself to the overall scientific uh, clean rooms where you have many, many different devices. So my look, microservices over the, it's basically, you can think about it as a, um, as a envelope of uh, where software basically task might be sitting and uh, every microservice then is an executing unit that executes these particular software threads um, uh, and tasks, uh, but this particular microservice then will have a small queue where then uh, overarching controlling unit basically can issue a task uh, to be processed. And the task basically can be compress this particular image or uh, analyze this particular image for a line. Uh, and then there could be many, many different customers that currently will get processed the same type of task, right? So you could have a compression task, uh, uh, a microservice, and then there are many, many different tasks because many different users come to the cloud uh, that come from SCM or TM or other sort of type of microscopes uh, and want to have a compression or decompression of the particular task. So these are currently, you have a microservice of the task A, a microservice of task B. And each of them has a queue where different customers, user A, user B, user C, might be waiting. Um, and uh, so microservice is actually the software development technique that currently very much is pushed by Google, by Microsoft, uh, and other cloud providers uh, to allow this particular task and uh, service sharing uh, in, the, in the cloud. Um, and uh, for us, it lends itself because these particular tasks then uh, and microservices can be separated. And as we will see, you can have then above these particular microservices, different controller that controls certain task graphs, right? The task graphs will be then corresponding to the workflow that needs to happen over the data. For, for the experiment. So um, separate task dependencies from task implementation uh, really allow us uh, this particular microservice model in the cloud, uh, the flexible workflow composition, right? Every user, if I go to a microscope or my colleagues go to microscope, do chips or do materials or do other sort of different tasks, they can have very different workflows and this microservice uh, concept uh, lend itself very well. So um, this is currently a um, sort of a high level architecture, how we actually envisioned this. Um, so you can see actually currently we have a, uh, you can have a tool where uh, a user basically puts together a uh, workflow composition, this particular time dependency, right? I need to com uh, compress a image. I need to analyze for a line. I need to uh, maybe extract some information from the image in terms of its circles and so on. Um, and you can create this kind of sort of task graphs uh, that they are going to be stored in this particular time dependency service uh, space. And then actually you have a user at the microscope who is currently having a web interface and um, it um, takes the image or takes the data from that particular microscope and uploads that particular image uh, to the, uh, to, to the um, uh, cloud. And so um, uh, I just want to sh uh, uh, sort of talk about it that then basically there is a, uh, this particular image goes a workflow invoker. That's the controller that will then control, take one task after another from the user's workflow and then run it through these task graphs, uh, uh, through these task microservices to actually get the particular task uh, workflow process. So here is currently an example, a user currently is at the microscope. Um, there is a web interface. It uploads the raw scientific data. It goes to the workflow invoker in the cloud. The uh, particular invoker asks actually the time dependency service uh, 
what kind of uh, uh, workflow dependencies did this particular user uh, upload in prior in the task dependency service that particular uh, graph gets uh, um, specified. This is currently task A and B should be processed on this particular image. Then this particular task graph gets uh, specified to the workflow invoker. You go to the first microservice, uh, the task A gets processed when it is done. Um, it basically reports and asks for the next uh, task uh, that it needs to be done. There is next task to be done. Task B gets again process. And if this is currently end, then uh, basically this particular process ends and the results is then being reported to the particular user um, in terms of curation or in terms of analysis that, that happened uh, going through that particular workflow. So um, uh, I want to a little bit more dive into the cloud cyber infrastructure because that is really, really important for us, uh, how these particular scientific processes then um, can benefit as they are being processed uh, uh, within the cloud. So um, uh, the challenges for um, us um, in terms of uh, the whole scientific data domain is that this particular domain of uh, clean rooms yields from the scientific instruments, heterogeneity in data formats, heterogeneity in workflow structures and usage patterns. Particularly, we actually call this particular data long tail data. And the long tail data really means that you have a lot of, lot of files, but these are very small files, the number of files. So usually an image, you know, it's a couple of um, kilo sort of, uh, of bytes um, and um, you might have maybe a gigabyte, but it's nothing you can sort of, you should differentiate the scientific data that for example, telescope uh, will produce, right? That's a terabytes to zettabytes, right? And we don't work with those particular data. This is particularly now, these scientific instruments in the clean room have small, a lot of instruments, but the scientists, students who are developing new chips will take a lot of data because they will change this chemical, that chemical, this particular parameter, uh, more pressure, more wind, more temperature on that particular, and on every change, they take an image. Right? So it's a very small of files, but many of them. So um, uh, we felt that these micro microservices are really allowing us uh, uh, working with this kind of long tail uh, data and then allow us to do advanced control optimization and learning capabilities over the system data for resource adaptation. So um, let me um, uh, sort of comment on the architecture, cloud architecture that we have actually designed because of the heterogeneity, we do need this whole execution layer that I explained at the beginning where you have the task dependency, every user has a different task flow um, or, or workflow. Um, and uh, we basically are then running different ta uh, tasks. Um, we are running them on top of a distributed resource management system. Currently, I will talk about some of the tools we use like Kubernetes or um, Docker Compose. Um, but because different users might have very different workflows, different data, we do need adaptive uh, monitoring and adaptive layer. And so we have been uh, working and designing then these uh, more service control layers, uh, the microservice monitoring layer, how much time does particular every micro, microservice and every task needs, uh, and then adapt actually. One of the important issues in terms of um, adaptation layer and monitoring layer is how many users do you admit into this particular system, right? And how long are you going to wait? Let's assume somebody sort of puts a workflow and then another user might wait forever, right? So we really wanted to understand and have monitoring how long are you currently taking. Uh, so this is currently the microservice log collector. We have a database, operational log database, and then there is a resource allocator for each of these microservices 
services and we wanted to actually control how many users currently can use microservice A, microservice B or C, right? And their tasks. So, um, uh, and there would be also alert uh, engine, basically. There is currently too many customers on the compression microservice, right? Too many customers. So that will take too long and therefore you might sort of get results late. Um, and um, the particular microservice adaptation layer helps us to get the particular system states from the mo microservice monitoring layer, and then actually identify the system, right? Sort of what particular um, uh, delays are we currently seeing, learning, uh, um, predicting uh, also what kind of delays uh, each microservice might be expecting, and then the whole workflow might be expecting. And then basically running an optimization algorithm to actually optimize assign currently so many, don't admit any other uh, customers until this particular microservice decreases number of customers per, per task. So um, this was basically the self-adaptive microservice it was very important to um, address the dynamism and heterogeneity that currently the cloud serving these clean rooms can, uh, can see. So, um, I wanted to uh, uh, comment a little bit on the architecture of uh, some of these services that we have in the monitoring and particularly in the adaptation layer as we are trying to adapt to very diverse uh, data, uh, workflows, and users. So, so uh, we will be monitoring uh, um, resources that uh, the microservice and their customers are currently using. And particularly, we will be monitoring, we are monitoring actually the workflow performance metric, which is the average delay of each workflow type and overall types. So currently, as we, we have been working now for many years with the material scientists, they have pretty simple um, workflows. So usually they will have either very linear, do task A, task B, task C. There are sometimes workflows where they basically will have a what if, uh, if you have this, um, do this particular task, if you have other condition, do this particular task. But so these are usually very typical workflow types that every image uh, or sort of going from these microscopes goes through. And so then actually we have been working on a uh, microservice workflow execution engine um, to try to predict uh, based on the current state every microservice is seeing in terms of number of customers, number of users wants to run task A, task B, task C, task T. We actually then use neural networks, uh, uh, CNN sort of to uh, predict actually what is the workflow type uh, for this particular type uh, uh, average delay or workflow type to delay and so on. And based on that particular delay, how long you will be spending in the, in the system, uh, we then actually can uh, uh, tell the user, you might need to still wait or, um, and also if the user puts certain boundary deadlines by when he or she wants to have that particular workflow processed, then we might basically start to uh, not even admit a user uh, saying, let's give these particular users in the system priority so that they can finish before the deadline. So the approach we currently use, as I mentioned, is machine learning. Uh, um, and here currently MK is basically the number of customer uh, consumers uh, over a particular task. Uh, um, and uh, there is basically the whole processing system that then takes uh, the workflows and uh, it, there is a certain average uh, uh, workflow delay over a particular sort of workflow type. Um, we do monitor as you saw, we have a very strong uh, monitoring uh, layer where we monitor all of these microservices and, and their tasks. Uh, um, and uh, they basically will provide us currently how long what takes individual microservices as well as the workflow. And that currently goes uh, uh, then to the controller. 
Um, we also get a certain reference uh, uh, what the real performance should be uh, and uh, what is desired the delays and deadlines um, so that this particular controller then based on the reference where a customer would like us to be uh, and what we monitor in terms of workflows being in terms of their delays, if we add another task uh, or, or another sort of number of consumers, MK plus one, we then run it through the, um, uh, through the uh, prediction model, the machine learning model, that particular machine learning model tells us what would be with the additional tasks, um, uh, customer, um, what would be the delay of that particular workflow. And um, uh, basically the controller then can decide Nope, uh, actually this particular new uh, set uh, state cannot be uh, admitted, uh, customers should be passed, or uh, yes, uh, this particular estimated delay for all of these different workflows is still fine, uh, and we can actually admit MK plus one uh, sort of uh, as a resulting number of tasks and customers. So that was sort of for us really important. Uh, and as I mentioned, the systems identification, the performance model, where we try if, if the, the what if scenario, if we add more customers uh, that are using certain workflow, um, uh, what would be the predicted delay was really, really important. And we'll use the multi-layer neural uh, network there um, to actually get us the estimation of that particular delay. If we give the particular systems the previous delay uh, of all the workflows under those particular customers that are currently in the system, what would be if we add new uh, customers, um, what would be the delay? So um, we build this particular system. And uh, as you can see, we uh, aim for using a lot of existing uh, uh, components for data processing, uh, uh, since I believe if this particular system should live for another at least five or 10 years, uh, it needs to be scalable. And one of the reasons why I'm saying that this system, this cloud system needs to live for five to 10 systems is because these scientific systems, these microscopes, you buy a microscope who costs two to $5 million once in a decade. You might maybe upgrade the particular computing facility around that particular microscope, maybe you know, once in two years. Right, so you go from Windows NT maybe to Windows 8 or Windows 10, and then maybe sort of at some point the uh, Siemens um, producer of these microscopes instrument says, "No, I'm not going to upgrade it." So we need to consider this very longitude of lifetime where the data will be processed uh, with respect to the instruments that are generating the data. Please keep that in mind in science. Data, uh, data live much, much longer than on your mobile phone. So um, uh, therefore, actually, I believe that we will need to build these cloud systems with something like Kubernetes, right? That Google is updating, you know, six months, eight months, every 12 months, RabbitMQ, of course, the publish subscribe type of system, uh, Apache Zookeeper, right? That does actually the task dependencies, right? Um, Grafana that visualizes InfluxDB that basically monitors all of the data that are currently coming from the microscope. And then of course, TensorFlow or other machine learning uh, system that predicts actually what kind of delay you would be envisioning or seeing if you add more customers into the system. And then op optimization, right? How many resources, how many customers are you allocating per microservice uh, uh, if your delay is uh, acceptable? So um, we have done some um, experiments. Uh, if the predictions that we are currently doing in terms of number of customers uh, are basically uh, good um, in terms of learning and optimization with respect to uh, what's the real actually load uh, that we are seeing. So the data processing workflow so that we have been working on, uh, you can see these are materials data workflows that they are very simple. But I also want to show you um, you probably heard about the 
LIGO experiment, right? Generating a lot of data. And on that particular data, there are very, very complex uh, uh, workflows, data workflows that basically the scientists want to do. And so we wanted actually to run this uh, through our cloud system. And um, we were actually very pleased that uh, <clears throat> the processing time um, was uh, uh, what we predicted in terms of the number of uh, um, uh, number of customers per microservices as they have been running. Um, the prediction in terms of the end-to-end -end delay of their um, of their um, uh, pipelines, their workflows have been very close to actually what we have then seen. Uh, so we have not seen actually that there have been then the actual time was very, very long. There are a little bit sort of some of those processing times, actual workflow uh, had been a little bit longer in terms of delay, but overall the predictors worked very well. And for the LIGO, uh, where you have very complex uh, workflows that worked even uh, better in terms of coverage. So um, I do want to now move to one of the issues that I pointed out a uh, little bit, and that is the longitude of these scientific instruments and the data that lives so long. So one aspect to consider as data scientists that are going to be designing data management systems in these clouds, you need to think about how do you upgrade these things over five, 10, actually in micro nanotechnology laboratory here, um, we have some instruments that are 20 years old. So just keep in mind. But one thing that does happen is that these older instruments, this uh, uh, at some point Siemens, Carl Zeiss, these are all companies that are producing these scientific instruments. They basically says, we are not going to upgrade your device drivers that are driving the microscope to new operating systems. So for example, we currently have 50% of our scientific instruments in one of the laboratories, which basically are not upgraded to Windows 10. They basically, the, the instrument producers stopped at Windows 7. And as you know, if you don't upgrade many of these operating systems that are driving, that are sitting next to this particular microscope, they are security prone, right? So what do actually our IT people would do? They would take these instruments off the network. So there is no connectivity because they are so worried that basically somebody attacks these instruments and then the optics, right? The, the microscopes, uh, cyber is just a small part. There is a lot of, lot of optics and mechanics and so on can work without upgrade, right? So the scientists want to use this as long as possible, but um, uh, then the IT people get very worried. So uh, then what do the scientists do? They leave actually Windows NT, Windows 7 running with all the security uh, sort of uh, problems and they use memory sticks. No network, but memory sticks. And so we really felt that just um, not quite the right solution. So we have been um, trying to uh, help um, at least with one possible approach. There are a couple of other approaches now starting to come up and are out, out there. So the obsolete security is a big, big problem. That's actually why these instruments often are producing tons and tons of data, but uh, are basically offline. Uh, also, you basically are starting to see if you don't upgrade your, your Microsoft, your computer that drives that microscope, uh, you start to see performance mismatches, right? Your cloud is getting upgraded to gigabytes, right? On 10 gig network. Uh, when these particular, some of these tools are on Windows NT, Windows XP, we have those, uh, they are TCP. Right, I mean, runs on 100 megabits or 10 megabits networks, right? And so that particular network protocol cannot uh, uh, keep up, right? So you are starting to sort of do retransmission and retransmission as a network problem. So anyway, so we basically proposed uh, to build a gateway, so-called security gateway that um, 
uh, currently uh, will actually uh, have certain strong security um, uh, capabilities so that uh, these uh, older equipment uh, uh, instruments can be actually connected to a private cloud on the campus. And so this particular gateway uh, now um, we basically split it actually, as we started to build it, we also started to learn that we can actually inside of the network put whitelisting. You start to also do certain um, uh, restrictions like how does the traffic can flow, right? And in this particular case, these instruments, you can only upload the data, right? And only an, an administrator uh, can sort of come and upgrade uh, or, or sort of uh, move the data. But the gateway actually then allows us to just move the data out to the cloud and sort of store it. But then if the scientist next to the instrument wants to see what is currently stored in the, um, in the cloud, one has to actually then log in through a laptop, modern upgraded laptop uh, into the cloud and basically see what's in the database, what is currently happening. But uh, as we upload, the particular data comes immediately into the cloud, can go through the workflow, and then basically it gets stored into the, uh, the website, uh, into the database. So um, this is currently some of the architecture where um, one way we have a switch, uh, local air network switch, usually lower bandwidth switch that has a strong security in terms of which IP addresses with MAC addresses it only allows to pass through. And then this particular gateway actually has also some of the tasks because it's a processor uh, processing capability, they actually can do some checks. And so we again uh, model this particular task as one of the workflows that basically you can use microservices, um, QBedge, for example, to actually run um, you know, some sort of processing, but only in one, one way. And uh, there basically um, you can sort of uh, then um, get um, uh, sort of some processing done on the edge and then sort of the rest of the processing done um, at, the, at the cloud. So this is currently how we build it. And actually now basically almost all of our older, particularly Windows 7, um, uh, all the equipment, as I said, 50% of our equipment was Windows 7, and they are all waiting now if Carl Zeiss, if Siemens, if uh, other companies will upgrade their drivers to the, to the microscope to Windows 10. But until that happens, uh, we basically are going through this bracelet server, which is the gateway that then connects us basically, uh, does get checked uh, through the bracelet network um, if this particular traffic comes from allowable devices, and then it basically gets forwarded through the campus network to the four seat cloud and storage, which is currently our uh, cloud, private cloud. So this is currently the uh, sort of, again, very much implementation of the, uh, various devices uh, uh, and software tools that uh, we can then keep upgraded. Uh, and so we are doing very strict uh, security um, through Shibole, uh, as well as uh, uh, we have at least some of the capabilities here to check uh, if um, uh, there is this particular instruments have been reserved, if this is currently okay, who the user who is currently using this particular instrument. And then, you know, these particular data are uploaded just one way. And um, again, one can actually check uh, through the edge what kind of task graph or workflow this particular data should go under. And um, there is currently possibility through the microservice at the edge that you can do uh, here uh, on the edge when the particular result happens, then uh, it basically moves uh, to the next uh, um, microservice on the cloud to process uh, the next task in that particular workflow. And again, um, we are on the cloud um, doing um, uh, performance estimation. Um, and uh, uh, even with this particular sort of bracelet, uh, um, we um, actually had a pretty good uh, prediction of the processing time uh, for these uh, um, uh, distributed uh, workflows between edge and then a cloud. Uh, the estimation happens uh, at the uh, at the cloud, so we don't have any 
uh, adaptive layer, the edge fully reports to the monitoring layer uh, of the cloud. And then the cloud basically processes uh, how many customers can be per, per microservice in that particular workflow. So um, uh, that sort of concludes the uh, data discussion uh, regarding what happens inside of this particular instrument and the cyber infrastructure that we are getting from those particular instruments. The last but not least part of this talk I would like to comment is uh, what happens in these clean rooms in terms of IoT data. So one of the really important aspects I want to argue is that these instruments, so these are currently some of the scientific instruments that we are um, working. Um, as you can see the longitude of this equipment, right? 30 years, 25 years on some of the equipment. Um, and they have these computers, right? That are ancient sometimes. So the aging definitely is very visible here. Um, but um, in order to do this kind of pl plasma etching and plasma deposition and so on, um, they really need not only the right conditions inside of the instruments, but also around these particular instruments. And so uh, if there is, for example, excess in humidity, then you might be getting actually wrong scientific result, wrong scientific data. And as you know, I pro you probably get it in, the, uh, in, in your research and in your classes uh, that your data is only as good as your sensors are, right? And so in this particular case, when you see, when you look at, at the left side, there is an image from his microscope that is currently under, the microscope is in the right humidity and temperature environment. On the other hand, on the right side, you have the same uh, situation, but with bad humidity, bad type of uh, uh, temperature external to them to that particular instrument. And you can see that the images that one gets are not correct. Okay, and so um, we actually really wanted to help the scientists not only get the data from those instruments, but also around those instruments. And so we actually then uh, started to work on a sensing cyber infrastructure to put different sensors around these instruments. And so here currently, for example, you can see um, uh, around these uh, uh, instruments, uh, monitoring of uh, diffusion, oxidation, annealing, uh, these kind of uh, uh, aspects to monitor through glass flow, gas flow sensor, temperature sensors. So we currently actually placed in, uh, in two uh, various uh, clean rooms, different of these uh, uh, sensors. Um, and um, this particular sensor uh, system, now it's an acquisition system called Senselet, that it collects the data to an edge device, and then from the edge device, it goes to the cloud. Um, and uh, it automatically actually collects the data, uh, the temperature humidity sensors real time, uh, goes into an influx DB database, the airflow uh, sensor. For example, this is a chemical fume hood where, um, uh, if a student previously forgets to close the fume hood, the temperature, the humidity of the whole clean rooms goes up. And so anybody who comes afterwards and starts to do some other experiment, even on another equipment, will get wrong results. The data is wrong. Right. So um, we um, built this particular infrastructure uh, with all these um, uh, edge, uh, the, the sensors and then put it to the uh, Raspberry Pis sense edges. And then it basically goes over campus Wi-Fi to a sense cloud that then gets connected to the four seed. Uh, we have timestamps and then we synchronize the data in the instrument and in those uh, uh, IoT devices so that people can, uh, for example, the lab managers really like to um, check our database, the InfluxDB database, what's happening there. Um, and also visualize it uh, either researcher or the lab manager basically can, can look at either what's happening in the lab or the researcher can actually look at what's happening on the instrument as well as uh, what's currently situation in, in, the, in the lab. Um, and uh, so we currently have, uh, as you can see, we are also currently 
play, paying attention in um, where to currently place these sensors so that they are not uh, obtrusing and uh, are not in the way of, uh, of this. And you can see there is currently microscopes, spinners, fume hoods, sort of, um, this is a very typical type of um, uh, clean rooms. So um, one other sort of sensing environment that we are just starting, and I wanted just to conclude, uh, is uh, Maintlet. Uh, Maintlet um, is um, uh, just starting, as I mentioned, and we want to actually use uh, sensors uh, around these instruments also to start to see the aging process. Um, so currently, uh, a lot of the instruments are being connected to pumps. For example, pumping a gas, pumping a chemical. Uh, and many of these pumps uh, are aging um, and failing. And so we basically really feel that if we can detect failure of these pumps, uh, um, we can actually avoid a failure of, uh, of these particular um, uh, big instruments. As I said, these are very expensive instruments. So um, uh, maintenance cost is very high. And so we really want to put uh, sensors now, basically not only monitor the micro uh, environment uh, uh, around those, this, the temperature and the humidity, but also put sensors around these uh, pumps that are actually very important for the maintenance. Uh, and um, then basically run on this particular data, this particular sensory data, various analysis to understand uh, uh, preventive maintenance, reactive maintenance, and predictive maintenance. This is currently where we use the IoT data um, uh, and AI analysis. So we are currently building the system, which um, basically will have the instrument sensors go to the edge, as we do in the sensor, sense led. Uh, but then basically they drive actually so-called uh, digital twin, uh, where basically we are going to be simulating different failures of these particular instruments uh, and um, populate the database with different failure modes. And so that basically when we do see sensing data from the particular instruments, we can then see the thresholds for failures and uh, do predictive maintenance and warn the lab managers, shut down or look at this, replace this uh, and so on. So um, uh, this particular whole framework system that we are currently building has reactive maintenance on the edge devices, but also then digital twin preventive maintenance as well as uh, predictive maintenance uh, uh, to help the users, uh, particularly the lab managers uh, to uh, keep track of these particular uh, instruments. Um, and uh, we are currently instrumenting again with a lot of sensors, uh, cyber data, collecting the data, analyzing the data, uh, the monitoring system uh, to, uh, to help these uh, clean rooms. So vibration sensor, for example, on these pumps. And you can, we are starting to see some interesting results where we are uh, analyzing the data um, at different months uh, uh, and see basically slow degradation and are working with the manufacturers as well as with the lab managers and users what would be the, some of the thresholds that they see that particular equipment needs to be going down for maintenance, for example. So um, in summary, I wanted to share with you, uh, this was a different domain of data science where we are collecting data from scientific instruments and have been building uh, uh, private clouds um, to um, uh, cloud infrastructure, software infrastructure, to uh, allow this particular data to be automatically uploaded from these instruments and then analyzed through the workflows for the users, um, react to their heterogeneity that is currently existing uh, in the clean rooms. I also wanted to point out the aging issue of these instruments. And then uh, instrumentation with IoT data uh, and IoT sensors, how that particular domain, uh, IoT cyber infrastructure can be very helpful also for these scientific environments to really have uh, correct uh, data of these scientific uh, experiments. Thank you so much, uh, and I'm open to any questions. Thank you, Clara, so much. That, that was an excellent talk. And it's very interesting to see these uses of data science in science and engineering applications. 
There were a couple of questions in the chat and one asked about the old scientific instruments, why Windows 7 and why not Linux uh, for running any of these? Right, so um, the, uh, a lot of these instruments um, are very dependent on these, um, uh, on these manufacturers. And uh, the manufacturers must uh, uh, see uh, uh, contracts. Um, and so uh, Siemens must have contract with Microsoft uh, um, uh, to um, really, but basically all of the PCs that we have here in the clean rooms run Microsoft OS. Um, and um, I am currently wondering if, uh, uh, you know, as you might know, the Linux OS programmers are very scarce, right? It really takes um, much more deeper knowledge. So you have to put yourself into the shoes probably of these uh, um, uh, manufacturers of these instruments. They are experts in physics. They are experts in these optics. Uh, uh, and so how it was explained to me in one of these uh, uh, demonstration um, uh, events that I visited when Siemens was there and uh, GE was there, uh, why Microsoft was um, that basically they are not a computer company. And so Microsoft works with them. Um, and this is currently also why the upgrades towards their interfaces, their SDKs, um, takes so much longer uh, because they have to work with a third party to build uh, then uh, the, the SDKs for a new Microsoft uh, operating system. When Windows 10 comes, their SDKs need to be upgraded and either they uh, go to Microsoft and it takes time, right? They are a niche uh, um, you know, uh, area, right? They are not the masses. And uh, so it takes them time. And I currently Thank don't know if Linux uh, uh, has that kind of collaboration with these manufacturers. Thank you. Um, Dan Tung, you asked a question about computational steering. Do you expect to use workflows to control the instrument based on data analysis and steer the experiments? That um, um, I, I don't know. Um, it's uh, at this point, uh, um, the scientists um, uh, usually there is a lot of manual work, so they specify certain workflow, um, and um, then um, when the workflow goes through, they store the data and they look at the data, uh, and then they go back uh, to uh, see if new setting of uh, uh, chemicals need to be done. But um, I, as I understood, um, there would be steering sort of more automatically uh, to that particular instrument. And I am not aware of that in the, uh, in the labs that I work with, they do automation. Now, it can be that the industry does that, right? Because they have robots. Here currently, a lot of the experiments are done by students, by uh, lab assistants, uh, uh, it's manual. So they, uh, th that particular feedback from the data um, uh, cycle uh, is manually put feedback into the experiment. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Bala Dasingu. Any estimate on how much data is being moved from the edge to the cloud? What happens if the data flow, for instance, becomes something like a terabyte per day? Um, at this point, um, we uh, we have not seen terabytes uh, uh, per day. Um, so, um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, now in the IoT space, uh, uh, these uh, sensors, the humidity sensors, and so on. They are usually very small uh, data uh, data sets, uh, and we sample them usually once in a minute. Also, at the edge device, we compress them. Right? I mean, if we see the same temperature, we sort of send uh, um, once in a minute, once in an hour, and so on. If there is no fluctuation, although the lab managers would like to see more, but but um, uh, currently we are actually limited uh, much more by number of plugs that we actually 3D printed uh, some cases that we can plug more sensors, but uh, it's much more hardware limitation than the bandwidth limitation from the edge to the, to the cloud. We have not yet 
put cameras uh, on these edge devices as a sensor. Uh, these are mostly one dimensional uh, airflow, um, temperature, humidity, vibration sensors. Thank you. There's also a question from Mary who asks, what if the, your backup to the cloud fails? Um, the backup to the cloud. Um, so we currently are uh, um, uh, moving the data more in real time. Um, so, um, uh, so, so real time in the sense that, uh, so there are two, two, two systems. Uh, in the four seed system that is currently um, uh, moving the scientific data uh, from the computer on the microscope to the cloud, they're actually, the microscope still, um, uh, the interface stores the data on the local disk. And then from the local disk, we have an interface where the scientist has to upload the data uh, into, the, um, into the private cloud. Uh, and uh, so there, there is a certain backup, right? That basically, if, even if the network connection or something goes wrong in the upload, um, we still have the local data. Now, um, uh, in terms of the backup uh, of the private cloud, we do have, so this is one of the really important issues um, that the data is very valuable. This is actually one of the really interesting uh, differences that I found for a material scientist or semiconductor fabrication scientist, data is the thesis. Data is the valuable thing, not the algorithms like for the computer scientists. Uh, and the reason is also that acquiring data is very expensive, right? All the chemicals, right? They very often just do one or two experiments. So they are very, very careful in the design of the experiment. Um, and then they expose the whatever chemicals to many, many different uh, um, uh, exposures. But uh, um, this was something that uh, there is not, an, this is actually another very interesting AI problem because they have a very small data set, right? Because it's just expensive. Some of these uh, chemicals are thousands of dollars, milligrams, grams, right, uh, to get. Um, so um, uh, we do back up actually on a weekly basis and sometimes even more often the, the private cloud. We have uh, uh, 20 terabytes of data for those clean rooms and then uh, map them to another uh, 20 terabytes um, sort of every week so that the data gets preserved. For the IoT data, um, we um, uh, have alert system so that if we see that the uh, there is some problem on the sensor side, on the edge side, or the network side. Uh, the cloud actually then alerts lab manager, um, there is a problem. I'm not seeing data, go and check. So thank you. There's a comment in, in the chat from Mary who says, data is the mana, everyone wants it. So I, I think with that, I, I, Claire, I wanna thank you again for giving this distinguished uh, lecture here. And it was very insightful. Thank you very much. Thank for you. Inviting me.